If you do not believe the story I am about to tell, may I suggest that you get someone to get hold of a copy of the racing reports concerning the events of April the 22nd, 1965. Horse racing has now been discontinued at Alexandra Park, to the surprise of many, but not to me. The public are now fully at liberty to wander at will over the green slopes which overlook the old race course. It was here, as a small boy, that I first met Meg. Why I called her Meg, I do not know, for I had never before met anyone with that name. But Meg, I named her then, and Meg, I call her still. I suppose I was five or six years of age at the time, and marvelled at the immense size and magnificence of the palace building, with its great windows and galleries, its towers and terraces, its well-worn steps and beautiful flower beds. My Aunt Jane, who accompanied me on this occasion, pointed out this and that attribute which at so tender an age I was unable to appreciate. It was the boating lake and the Italian ice cream man that attracted my special attention. I remember being intrigued by her constant explanation that the bowling green, the rockeries, and so many other features had been the work of the German prisoners of war, who had been interned there for a time. My curiosity had been aroused, and I began to question her about it. Where were they kept, auntie? I inquired. Oh, in the dungeons, I expect, she replied impressively. The dungeons? I asked excitedly, where are the dungeons? Why, under the terrace, she replied. From that moment, I was no longer interested in any other feature of Alexandra Palace. There was no peace for Aunt Jane till she had led me down the steps to the level path below the terrace, from whence the lawns sloped steeply down to the race course. With awed delight, I examined the small barred windows. This was real adventure. Then I saw Meg. She was a pretty young woman with golden hair and sad eyes. I suppose I was too young at the time to analyse details much but I was nevertheless aware that she was dressed in a manner different from the women folk I was in the habit of seeing every day. A sort of picture book lady was how I suppose I summed her up at six years of age. It was those sad eyes as she looked out from the barred windows that caught my attention and made me feel very sorry for her. Now that the war is over, why do they still keep people in the dungeons, auntie, I asked. But they don't, she assured me. Then what's that lady doing in there, then, I asked. What lady, she inquired. I can't see anyone. But I've just seen a lady in there, I insisted, pointing to the barred windows. Oh, you're just imagining things, she declared. Or perhaps it was a cleaner gone to fetch something that they store there. I was not impressed by the explanation and wanted to investigate the half-open door a little further along the wall. But Aunt Jane decided that we spent enough time peering into dark places and hurried me off to look at the peacocks strutting about in their enclosure. When we got back home, there were the inevitable questions from the family about 
whether I had enjoyed my outing and, of course, whether or not I'd been a good boy. Oh, he was no trouble, Aunt Jane assured them, but I had a job to get him away from the dungeons. The dungeons? echoed Uncle Tom. Whatever did he want with the dungeons? They've not been used for years. Oh, yes, they have, I said quickly. I saw poor Meg there. There was a sudden silence in the room. It seemed to last so long that I began to think that I must have said something terribly naughty. Meg, inquired my uncle at last, tell me what you saw, lad. I described the sad lady I'd seen looking out across the lawns to the race course below. My uncle changed the subject, and after a while I went out into the garden to play. It was thirsty weather, and not long after I returned to the house to fetch a drink, and as I entered the kitchen I heard my uncle speaking in the next room. I'm not so sure, he was saying. There are several people who say they have seen her, and always on this same day, April the 22nd. There was the case of the German prisoner of war who was seen running terrified down Turnpike Lane. Everybody thought he was trying to escape from internment, but when they caught him, exhausted at the bottom of the hill, they found him to be almost out of his mind. When they could get him to talk sensibly, he claimed that he'd seen a ghost on the race course. Naturally, everybody believed that he was making up a wild tale in order to excuse his break for liberty. But the strange thing was that he called her Meg, and his description of her fitted in with the legend. Then my uncle caught sight of me standing at the door and started talking about something else. Nothing more was ever said about it to me. The years that followed brought quite a few changes. The old tram cars disappeared. A motorway replaced the old tramway track in the park. One of the palace towers was removed and replaced by a tall aerial mast, television they called it. Logie Baird began his experimental work on the race course side of the palace. I was by this time in my early twenties and living in Duke's Avenue, a road adjoining the palace grounds. A young man had come down from Scotland to help with the television project, and as he had few local friends, Mac was glad to visit me from time to time. From him I learned something of the frustrations of these early television pioneers. Things were not running smoothly. Sometimes he would say, it almost seems as if there is some unseen hand at work wantonly interfering with our progress. I can't altogether explain what I mean, but there are so many little things, illogical things. What I am trying to say is that things grow wrong when there is no scientific explanation to justify it. It's almost as if someone was telling us we are working in the wrong place. Then came the unforgettable night, when Mac knocked on my door as I was mounting the stairs to my bedroom after a glorious spring day. His excitement was intense, as I could tell by his lapsing into his Scottish brogue. Something out of the ordinary had obviously happened. What's the trouble, Mac? I asked. Something very strange has just happened, he said breathlessly. We had been trying out a new camera all day, but with no positive results. 
in the end, the rest of the team decided to call it a day. But I insisted on carrying on because I had an idea at the back of my mind that I could make it work. They'd all gone off together and I worked on a different wiring. When I was satisfied that I was on the right track, I set up a vase of daffodils and switched on, hoping for a picture. It took a while to warm up, but gradually I saw a picture begin to take shape. As it got clearer, I saw to my astonishment that it was not a picture of daffodils, but of a girl, a pretty girl dressed in old-fashioned clothes. I saw her just for a moment, then she was gone, and I couldn't get any picture at all. I just couldn't account for it. The daffodils were still where I had left them. The studio was empty, and the door was shut. I've searched the corridors and offices, but there is no sign of anyone, and the outside door was locked. There were no pictures in the studio which even remotely as resembled the girl I saw. Meg, I exclaimed involuntarily. Seeing his look of amazement, I gripped his arm reassuringly. Hold on a moment, I said, and I'll go back with you. We hurried through the park gates and along the terrace. Mac led the way toward the door that led to the studio, his keys rattling somewhat loudly in his hand. He was about to open the door when I called Tim to come back, for irresistibly I felt drawn toward the lawns. Down this way I called and led him down the steps. As I expected, the door was open. But this door is always kept locked. Mac explained. We keep some of our stores there. With difficulty, I restrained him from entering, for obviously he had not seen her standing there. Nor did he appear to notice her as she moved away down the hill toward the race course. What's the matter? he asked, and turned to follow my gaze. Still he saw nothing, but I did. It was unmistakably Meg. She still seemed as young as on the first day I had seen her. There was the same sad expression on her pretty face. What's the matter? Mac asked again. It's April 22nd, I replied. And that was Meg, you saw. I have never described this incident to anyone until now, and I do not think Mac ever did. He never mentioned it in our later meetings. His wife has since told me she more than once could never understand his dislike of daffodils in the house. I never had the courage to tell her the reason. It is amazing how quickly the years have gone by. The second war came and went. Now I live miles away in Sussex and cannot remember when I last visited Alexandra Palace. As my family can tell you, I am not a follower of horse racing and decidedly not a gambling man, but something, I know not what, impelled me to watch the television program one afternoon when all my common sense told me I should be getting on with my work. How familiar it all seemed as the TV camera scanned the slopes of Alexandra Park. We were shown the imposing palace on the hill, silhouetted against the sky, the race course nestling beneath, the crowds surging as they had done for fifty years before. I watched the horses lining up for the Priory Handicap. There were twenty-seven of them. 
those of you who watch the race on television will agree with me that there was something very unsettling about the preliminaries. I began to get anxious. There was something strange about the way the horses were behaving. Something was making the crowds restive. I felt the tension mounting within me until, at last, the starter got them away, and the horses surged forward and thundered across the heavy turf. Suddenly, about two furlongs out, it happened. As you will know from the newspapers, there was a steward's in inquiry afterwards to investigate what caused the confusion that so nearly had fatal results. The explanation which the committee finally accepted and which was put in the press was what the saddles slipped, causing the apprentice jockey to fall, although it was maintained that it had been thoroughly tested by the starter's assistants before the race. Witnesses were most insistent about this fact. The saddle had been properly fixed and officially checked. If I had offered my evidence, they would not have believed me. I saw exactly what happened, and knew instantly why I had been drawn to the television set that afternoon. It was April the 22nd, and Meg was abroad. The horses had sensed her approach from the time she left the terrace. She had reached the rails as the race started. This I had clearly seen as I sat nervously in front of my television set nearly a hundred miles away. She did not halt at the rails. She continued on her time-honoured route which went right across the race course. Suddenly she was in the midst of the flying hoofs. In desperation I raised my arm, jumped from my armchair as I saw her hands touch the saddle. Meg, I shouted in horrified tones. Even as I called, she looked up as if she'd heard. I saw once again her golden hair and sad eyes. In a moment, the horses had all swept by. All, that is, except one for it was April Court which had fallen. Meg moved sadly away, and I sank into my armchair, soaked with perspiration. If the stewards had climbed the hill to the terrace, I no doubt believe that they too would have seen the open door. A few years later, Alexandra Palace was completely burned out, as you know. The door under the terrace was open.